immature stages, a new dimension to butterfly recording, question mark. Uh, so now that the life cycles of British and Irish butterflies have been published, um, I honestly believe that there is more that we could potentially do uh, in terms of recording our butterfly fauna um, by taking more of an interest in, in the immature stages. Um, but what I'd like to do is really start with four uh, known examples of where we already do this today. Um, probably the most well-known is uh, the monitoring of brown hair streak populations by looking for their eggs. So the white eggs uh, are laid on uh, very dark blackthorn bark and are relatively easy to find. Um, so easy, in fact, that so there are brown hair streak winter egg search parties that go out and do an amazing job at recording uh, the populations of brown hair streak, which is really a very elusive butterfly that those of you that have tried to find them. Um, and it's very, uh, well, it's a little bit easier to find their eggs than it is to actually find the adult butterfly. Uh, quite re rewarding as well, getting out there and uh, finding these uh, immature stages. So, so that's probably a pretty well-known example of how we already uh, use recording of immature stages to monitor uh, populations. Uh, another example is silver-spotted skipper. It lays its eggs on tufts of sheep's fescue, often growing over bare ground. So in the top left um, uh, picture here, you can just about make out a female laying eggs on some sheep's fescue. I think this was taken at Broughton Down in Hampshire and the uh, pudding-shaped egg in the bottom left-hand uh, corner there. And one of the things that uh, I know Martin Warren and uh, Dan Hoare especially do each year is uh, follow a continuous transect and use a quadrat to measure and count the eggs found in the quadrat uh, along a slope. Uh, so probably back-breaking work, but you know, a good uh, proof point of how we're uh, currently monitoring uh, silver-spotted skipper welfare, trends, and so on, uh, by using uh, a count of, in this case, an egg, again, of an immature stage. And there's also a couple of examples where we monitor larvae. So uh, both of these species that I'm going to mention uh, are easily monitored because their larvae are uh, gregarious to a large degree uh, until they're fine, you know, the very late instars, uh, normally the final instar. Now, one of those is the marsh fritillary. On the left-hand side here, you can see uh, a shot of a place called North Bull Island, which is just off the coast of uh, Dublin. Uh, so I spent some time working in Dublin and had the opportunity to uh, take a look at the marsh fritillary population there. Um, the site itself has got a very high density of Devil's Bit Scabious, which is the larval food plant of marsh fritillary. And what you can see in the top right there, in around about August, you can start to make out very... Uh, sometimes very large structures, which are the larval webs that have been created. Um, they're especially visible when lots of um, eggs have been laid in uh, close proximity to one another. Um, and there was one occasion where I found three females laying on almost the same leaf, let alone the same plant. So two were definitely on the same leaf uh, and another on an adjoining leaf. And later in the year, they formed a fairly um, large structure uh, once the larvae had emerged and um, come together in a single group. So while you can find these large uh, structures, the webs that occur in uh, summer, in August in this example, the larvae are actually much more visible the fo uh, following hibernation. So in this case in February, I remember one occasion uh, standing on a, a small mound and being able, be able to count uh, approximately 25 to 30 groups of larvae from a distance because they are, you know, black, uh, normally dense uh, uh, clusters that are, you know, have a background that's normally relatively pale. In this case, you know, the dead uh, strands of the various grasses that they're sitting on here, as you can see in the bottom right. So again, this is a fairly easy way of monitoring uh, the marsh fritillary. Um, and just carrying on with this theme, uh, on that same trip, um, I also came across an area which was actually also uh, populated by marsh fritillary larvae and found that the whole site had been flooded. And I thought it was quite interesting to note that the larvae had managed to uh, evade certain <laughs> death by climbing up the highest stems and forming the kind of clusters that you see here. So it wasn't something I'd ever seen before, but absolutely fascinating. So another species that can be monitored based on the uh, clusters of larvae that form is the Glanville Fritillary. So here you can see two sites in the southwest of the Isle of Wight. Uh, on the left you've got Compton Chine, and in the bottom right you've got Shepherd's Chine. 
what you can see on this slide is that um, towards uh, you know late summer again as the larvae have emerged from their eggs um, the larvae will actually bin, build these dense webs which allows them to be located um, and it's a little more difficult to find their hibernacular but at the end of the year they form these very dense structures um, I always say they're about the size of a tennis ball which isn't quite right they're the size of a tennis ball if you take into account the surrounding vegetation but within that it's more like a, the size of a golf ball which probably hold about 150 to 200 larvae uh, in the top right here then you can see the following uh, you know start of spring or certainly after the winter that the larvae just like the marsh marsh fritillary emerge in these very dark and very visible uh, clusters um, sitting on top of the uh, uh, webbing that they form uh, and on which they bask in order to raise their body temperature which uh, helps with digestion but again this is a good example of how we can monitor uh, a population of butterflies by using an immature stage in this case glanville fritillary larvae so having covered those four species the next question is could this uh, in theory be applied to all species in terms of recording immature stages um, so what I'd like to do really is just start with a story of a species that is fairly remote from me. I live in southern England, but the checkered skipper lives in the area around Fort William in Scotland. Uh, unfortunately, I was uh, working in Glasgow for a couple of years, and this allowed me to make um, fairly frequent trips up into uh, the Highlands to look for checkered skipper. Uh, in particular, um, a lot of people will be familiar with uh, Glasdrum Wood if they've ever tried to search for checkered skipper. It's one of the most well-known sites for the species and also the most southerly sites uh, in Scotland. Of course, there's now a reintroduction program underway uh, in Rockingham Forest in Northamptonshire as well. Um, so for those of you that don't know Glasdrum Wood, it sits on the banks of Loch Crerran uh, below Ben Chalane, and there's a car park. Uh, this is an interesting view on the left-hand side from the other side of Loch Crerran uh, that not many people uh, have seen I'm sure uh, and as you walk into the reserve because uh, it is a national nature reserve there is a post that you come across which has a checkered skipper emblazoned on it so uh, you know that you're in the right place once you uh, start walking up the path uh, and onto the site uh, and when you get there um, you're faced with this kind of view um, so essentially there's a way leave underneath the uh, power cables uh, which gets cleared every seven or eight years, I believe, but it does maintain the kind of habitat that the uh, checkered skipper prefers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we uh, go through this. Um, so, one of the encounters I had with the checkered skipper, which I thought I'd just throw in, uh, was on the 27th of May 2014, when uh, I was taking a photo, actually, of a small pearl bordered fritillary, which actually flies at the site, and a checkered skipper flew in, it remained there for about three seconds and then flew off. But during that moment, I got one of the, uh, probably one of my favorite photos there. It's got lots of clutter in the background and all, all of that, but uh, in terms of a memory, it uh, really did crystallize uh, the enjoyable times that I had monitoring the checkered skipper at this particular site. So very unusual, two rarities side by side, as I always say. Um, on uh, during the same period, uh, I also came across uh, a whole bunch of different things. Uh, one of those was a mating pair, which are rarely seen, actually. They didn't look like this when I first came across them. What I actually saw was something flickering in the corner of my eye. And it was this, with the uh, two butterflies dangling down one from the other underneath a fern. Uh, so I gave them a little bit of a helping hand to prop them up. And then I got the photo that I really wanted, which was the one on the left. Uh, so cheating maybe, but uh, did them no harm whatsoever. Um, a later trip the same year, 2014, I also found a female who's fluttering, ar fluttering around the purple moorgrass plants, uh, which is the larval food plant for the checkered skipper uh, in Scotland anyway, uh, and saw her lay an egg. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Got some photos and thought nothing more of it really, because I didn't have any plan in mind for actually monitoring the uh, checkered skipper at this point in time. But later that year I got slightly bored and so I thought well uh, it's quite well known that the checkered skipper caterpillar has a very distinctive feeding damage that it causes so uh, so I went back in September in order to see if I could find the feeding damage and that really was all I was hoping to see was a larval tube with some notches taken out of uh, the grass blade and so on and so on 
um, so you can see what it's like in September in Glasgow and Wood. There certainly aren't any other visitors <laughs> on site at that time of year, um, although there are fewer midges, which is one blessing. Uh, and in the bottom right there, you can see um, a purple moorgrass uh, tussock. Um, so the plant actually stands uh, fairly erect, I would say, in terms of the blades, uh, mostly pointing upwards and outwards. Um, so fairly easy to uh, distinguish the purple moorgrass from any other grasses that you might come across. Um, so I was looking for notches, and I spent a lot of time on sites um, uh, being diverted by the attention and the... Uh, the various notches that have been created by all sorts of things, whether it was a leaf hopper or a saw fly, found drinkum off larvae as well. Um, what I didn't see was a checkered skipper caterpillar. And so I kind of reverted back to um, uh, the work of Neil Ravenscroft, who actually studied the checkered skipper for his PhD thesis. And he wrote a butterfly conservation booklet on the checkered skipper, um, which contains some very useful information. And I was reminded, um, I actually took a uh, a couple of uh, things with me to look at so while I couldn't find anything I was just looking you know referring back to this document and this particular profile really struck me because you can see that if you're looking for larvae then you're not at the very bottom of the slope and you're not at the very top of the slope or even part way uh, towards the top of the slope but you're looking for these flushed soils and I later found out that there are some uh, plants that help you identify the right kind of uh, area to be in. So it's things like the presence of bog myrtle, bracken, downy birch and what have you. Um, so that was the area that I then focused on and lo and behold I started to find uh, what, what I thought um, and I certainly now believe are checkered skipper uh, larval tubes. So um, as we'll see what the caterpillar does is it actually creates these tubes by spinning silk across uh, the two sides of a leaf blade which then pulls uh, the two sides together as the silk dries. So on the left hand side you can see a uh, tube that's been fairly well eaten both above and below it and on the right hand side you can see the characteristic notches below uh, a larval feeding tube which is thought um, to be a means of ensuring that nutrients are retained in the leaf above the notches while the larva feeds. Um, but, in no, but both of these tubes were vacated, there was no larva to be seen. And then, while I was taking a picture of this particular tube, uh, you can just about make a tube between two grass blades there, indicating that it's a, you know, a larger larva, which you'd expect to see uh, at the time of year, this time of year. Um, but while I was taking a photo of this, uh, I was using a tripod, and one of the tripod legs uh, was touching another grass blade, and I looked down, and I didn't and I noticed there was another tube. Um, but because I tapped this accidentally, this, uh, this tube, uh, I saw this, and I must admit, I've never been so happy to see an anal flap, as we say. Um, and tapping it a little more, what came out, what reversed out of the tube, was uh, my first sighting of a final instar checkered skipper larva. So, how happy was I? So, this kind of confirmed that actually, uh, yeah, I could find the larvae as well. So, I'd seen the mating pair, to find an egg. Uh, and now I'd find uh, a caterpillar as well. So that really set my mind going as to what the potential was for doing, uh, you know, more detailed work in the following two years where I'd be, be up in Glasgow. Uh, so I actually did a survey of a number of sites in 2015 in, or in order to come up with, uh, you know, a plan of attack for thinking about, well, how could I monitor uh, the immature stages of Checkered Skipper? So from north to south, it included the Butterfly Conservation Reserve at Old Mahuic, uh, Glen Loy, the area around Speen Bridge, uh, Glen Nevis, in, in the wet, on the west coast, Ariundel uh, Woodlands, which is also a national nature reserve, and then towards the south, the head of Loch Eteve, and then Glasdrum Wood, which, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the most southerly sites for the Chequered Skipper in Scotland. So having gone around all those sites, I finally focused on Glasdrum Wood. Uh, it did seem to be a fairly confined site. Uh, for example, Larry Undal, which is another really good site, is just absolutely huge. Uh, you'd, you'd probably end up walking about 9 or 10 miles every day to actually cover the site. Whereas Glasdrum Wood, um, you know, you've got a few hundred metres, and that's pretty much it, where the Chequered Skipper uh, population is, is most concentrated.
So lots of repeat visits, um, but ultimately, to cut a long story short, so I've managed to find uh, more egg-laying females. Uh, some of the other visitors on site were able to point me to locations where they'd seen eggs being laid, but I was able to uh, find eggs, uh, watch them colour up, um, to the point where you could actually see the head of the larva uh, at the top of the egg, as you can see in the bottom right here. Um, and on one particular occasion, I saw a caterpillar actually emerge, which was amazing. So I managed to just about get a photo of it eating its uh, eggshell. Uh, subsequently, uh, building a tube by spinning silk from side to side. And as I mentioned, um, as the silk dries, it contracts. And that's how it forms this um, uh, cylinder within which the larva can then uh, live and f uh, feed out of uh, either end. And the final construction is on the right hand side, which is like a zipped up... Uh, uh, leaf blade as you see there. Subsequent visits allowed me to also find a second instar larva and on the left here you can see the larva creating a notch below its feeding tube. Uh, as I mentioned earlier this is um, we believe a mechanism for the larva to ensure that nutrients are retained above the notch while it uh, feeds above and below its feeding tube. And a close up on the right there. And again further visits allowed me to find a third instar larva there's a minor difference in appearance here, which is that on the last segment at the tail end of the larva, there's an hourglass shaped black mark, which is, you know, it distinguishes the third instar larva from earlier instars. So it was nice to find that. Um, and then the fourth instar larva is very similar in appearance to the third instar larva, apart from the fact that it's larger. So it's, uh, when fully grown, it's um, longer. And the head capsule is slightly larger as well, as uh, you know you'd find in most uh, caterpillars as they go from instar to instar. And then finally, uh, I showed you a newly molted final instar larva earlier. This is a fully grown final instar caterpillar, and it's surprisingly well camouflaged, even though it tends to feed more openly on the uh, grass blades of purple mall grass. And then ultimately, with the onset of winter, once it's finished feeding up, it creates a high binaculum by spinning together uh, a number of uh, purple moorgrass leaves within which it actually builds a fairly compact, uh, what I can only describe as a cocoon, a very dense silk structure within which it ultimately overwinters. And just to uh, show you what I'm talking about, here's a grayscaled version of that particular high binaculum just to uh, lift it out of the picture there. And in the spring, plasterum wood is transformed. So what was a fairly uh, greeny brown site towards the uh, end of September into October is now uh, looks more like a hay meadow with lots of dead purple moorgrass leaves uh, across the, the site itself. Um, so purple moorgrass is a deciduous perennial, so it will sprout new growth in the spring. Of course, finding caterpillars uh, in this kind of terrain is extremely difficult. Uh, fortunately, if you know where they've uh, created their high binacular, then it's a little bit easier, of course. Uh, here's a couple of shots of myself and my friend Mark Colvin uh, looking to relocate post-hibernation checkered skipper larvae. And the reason this is so difficult is that while the checkered skipper has a green larva uh, just before it goes into hibernation, it transforms into a straw-coloured larva uh, post hibernation which makes it extremely difficult to find not simply because of its appearance but also because it tends to wander so while you may have things marked up on a particular tussock they will wander between tussocks as well in uh, my limited experience um, and on the right hand side here you can see a larva that's um, essentially pulled a few blades together with some uh, very simple ties of silk and has actually got a silk girdle around it so you can tell that it's about to pupate and then the ultimate goal of course well for me anyway was to complete the life cycle so actually finding a larva that had finally pupated uh, so the three shots are clearly taken at different times but newly formed on the left hand side uh, colored up in the middle and then finally after about 42 days i think this was the uh, butterfly you can see is fully formed there in the pupil case Unfortunately, I didn't get to see the adult emerge, despite spending an inordinate amount of time waiting for the big event. But there we go, these things sometimes happen. Um, now, in terms of monitoring uh, and recording, one of the things that I was um, actually quite curious about was if I compared some of my observations with Frederick Frohawk, 
who conducted a similar study in the 1920s, um, the timings of the different stages uh, were very similar, which is surprising because he studied his from an English colony in captivity and I studied mine in a Scottish colony in the wild. Um, the only thing I can put this down to really is that the Gulf Stream uh, ensures, you know, my, my assumption was that the weather in Scotland is cold, um, that the, the emergence would be delayed and behind the English colonies uh, that existed at the time. But that isn't the case. Because of the Gulf Stream, then the uh, temperature and the climate is actually uh, much warmer than you might expect um, in, you know, for, for the most part of Scotland, for example. Uh, so there's quite a good correlation between the, um, uh, you know, the timings of each of the different uh, larval instars, especially in the stages more generally between myself and Frohawk. Uh, and on, on these charts you can see uh, L5, which is the fifth instar. Uh, one is pre-hibernation, two is during hibernation, and three is post-hibernation. Now what I felt was really interesting was that if you look at a typical phenology chart that shows the timing of the different life cycle stages, then uh, this is what we would typically see. You'd see some um, uh, representation for each week you know just breaking down each month into four weeks for simplicity um, but you see some representation of the presence of each of the stages in each week of a year um, but with my study and actually correlating my work with Frohawk and Ravenscroft and uh, a few others uh, we were able to build a more detailed phenology chart uh, where the black circles represent actual observations and then the unfilled circles are just a, an estimate based on those observations um, but you could see that in theory we should be able to map out quite precisely the different instars and stages for uh, each species, in this case the checkered skipper. And the impact of this or the, the value of this potentially is to look at the changes to these uh, durations and timings uh, from year to year and see if there are any trends and any effect uh, from site to site, uh, the impact of climate change and so on and so on, which could then for example be correlated with the, the nutritional value of the food plants that are available, so purple mole grass in the case of the Scottish colony, uh, because that is a factor in terms of the welfare of the checkered skipper. So all in all, uh, quite fascinating in terms of uh, what the potential is now were we to record it in this uh, admittedly very detailed level. So if we can manage to get this kind of detailed level of recording of uh, the checkered skipper in mature stages, um, in theory, you could apply this for every single species uh, to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, for those of you thinking about, well, maybe doing this for a species, maybe on my local patch, I just thought I'd throw in a few additional things just to consider. One of those is that there is variation uh, in each of the stages, actually. And of course, you need to ensure that you know what you're looking at if you uh, are recording. So there's variation in eggs. So many viewers will be familiar with the color change in the orange tip, which is so not shown on the left here. So a uh, fairly white egg when it's newly laid, but after a day or so turns bright orange. Uh, this is thought to be a means of informing a female that's thinking of laying an egg that the egg is already present on the plant uh, to deter her uh, since the larvae are cannibalistic, in, especially in the early instars. Uh, the same colour change occurs in the dingy skipper, which is shown on the right here. And it's thought that maybe this is because uh, similarly a female shouldn't lay an egg if there's an egg already present in case multiple larvae strip the food plant bare and then ultimately perish. Uh, so a slightly different reason for that. There's also variation in larval instars, uh, sorry, in larvae in general, but certainly within, even within certain instars. But within the marbled white, which is what's shown here, um, which is nocturnal, then there are two colour forms, brown and green, as you can see here. Um, you'll also come across the um, maybe meadow brown larvae when you're looking for uh, uh, marbled white larvae and the key distinguish distinguishing feature here is the brown head uh, whereas in the meadow brown it's uh, green as well and the larva is much hairier too. There's also variation in pupae so uh, if you're trying to monitor black hair streak for example then there are two forms two color forms of pupae as you can see here uh, brown and black um, and again this is intended to mimic a bird dropping in this particular case uh, so good luck finding those. Finally, uh, uh, the camouflage that various stages have is also can also make things rather difficult. So on the left here uh, are some black hair streak eggs. Unlike the brown hair streak eggs, which we started with, uh, they're not white. They are also brown, like the bark they're laid upon. So much, much more difficult to find. Uh, 
and on the right here is a white letter hair streak lava and you can just about see it against the uh, in the bottom right corner here against an elm flower which it's uh, feeding upon and again uh, you know can make things rather tricky there are also hidden subjects as well so on the left here we've got uh, some uh, small skipper eggs which are laid in a sheath of uh, bl grass blade in the middle we've got a small blue larva uh, that is feeding inside a kidney vetch floret uh, so you can just about see its entry hole towards the top of the floret and on the right hand side we've got another skipper that's uh, feeding on a grass blade as we've been discussing when we were talking about uh, checkered skipper larvae so hidden subjects as well and then finally, just like marbled white being a nocturnal subject, um, on the left here you've got a meadow brown larva, and on the right, Duke of Burgundy feeding on a primrose leaf. So what can we conclude from all of this? So, my conclusion is that, uh, you know, is this a new dimension to butterfly recording? Well, no, because we're already applying it, and I gave examples of four species earlier, the brown hair streak, um, the marsh fritillary, the glandular fritillary, and the silver spotted skipper. But in theory, this could uh, also be applied to all other species too. It's more a case of you know dedication, patience, time, and so on and so on. But it is very enjoyable being able to look at um, all of the uh, species in a kind of new light. And by the way, that's a picture of a uh, white admiral uh, first instar larva creating a pier at the end of a honeysuckle leaf. But based on this kind of uh, study, well, what can we measure? Well, certainly, um, you know, the timing of the life cycle stages so the phenology and changes of that over time, distribution and population trends over time as well. And of course, that, in, that valuable data can then be used to infer various things, suitability of a habitat, uh, the effectiveness of habitat management, impact of climate change and other things I'm sure and I would love to hear from anyone actually who thinks uh, who has other ideas about how this kind of information could be used uh, to help conserve our butterflies uh, and their habitats um, and finally there's no excuses anymore <laughs> for not doing this so so my book on the left here and of course the the amazing book by Barry Phil uh, and Richard uh, field guide to the caterpillars of Great Britain and Ireland, which uh, uh, admittedly is focused on final instar larvae, but nonetheless will give you a clue as to, to what you're looking at. So, so get out there, look at the caterpillars, uh, and I hope this has been a useful respite from the uh, current situation we're in while we're all stuck at home. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, I may post some other videos if I get a moment as well. So uh, do let me know what you think, and uh, talk to you soon.